Today we have a member of the Texas House of Representatives, James Tallarico, who's currently in Washington, D.C. after leaving the state to deprive Republicans of the quorum needed to pass their voter suppression bill. James, thank you for coming back on. Thanks for having me on. You've been busy from MSNBC to Fox. You, you, you're everywhere. Yeah, you know, it's, it's been a whirlwind. Um, obviously, I prefer to be back home um, uh, and not in Washington, D.C., but uh, the Republicans in our state gave us really no other option but to, but to leave uh, to defeat that voter suppression bill. Yeah, well, so there's a lot to talk about here. First of all, are you and other Texas Democrats at risk of being arrested if you go back to Texas now? And if and when you wait out the special legislative session, does that risk go away? So yes, we're at risk for being arrested. In fact, the governor has promised to arrest us, so it's almost a certainty that's what happened. That's what would happen if we cross state lines to go back into Texas. Um, you know, this is the same governor that uh, introduced this voter suppression bill in the first place to appease Donald Trump and his big lie. It's the same governor that canceled the entire legislative branch of Texas state government by defunding our staffs uh, and the resources we need to operate. And it's the same governor who is now threatening to put legislators in handcuffs. I mean, it's sometimes it's it's hard to believe this is all happening uh, in the United States of America, right? It sounds like something you would have seen in, in another country, in another time. Um, and it's a it's a slow moving crisis, so it, it's easy to to kind of be, become desensitized to all of this and to just accept it. Um, but we really can't do that. Otherwise, we're at risk of losing this entire democratic project. I know that the intention isn't to leave Texas forever, but. Eventually, Abbott's going to call a special legislative session, which he has the power to do unlimited times, and you won't have the numbers to win that vote. And so the goal here is to get national Democrats to step up and figure out a way to pass the For the People Act. But with that said, are you prepared to leave again if you find yourselves in a similar situation and we haven't quite gotten there yet? You know, I think quorum breaking is always going to be in our toolbox. Um, it always has to be on the table. Obviously, we try to reserve it for the most egregious abuses of power. Um, you and I have talked about the fact that we don't we don't break quorum all the time. We, we lost a vote on a ban uh, on abortion in the state of Texas last session. We lost a vote on permitless carry of handguns. Uh, we lost votes on, on all types of really important uh, policy topics, but we didn't break quorum. We, we fought the good fight, we lost, we dusted ourselves off and got back to it the next day. The reason, as, as we have talked about, the reason we broke quorum on voting rights is because voting rights is not an issue like every other issue. It is foundational. It is essential. It underpins all those other issues. Without it, we can't have this discussion in the first place. Um, you know, I think my little sister, I have a little sister, her name is Madeline, um, and she's like a right brain person. Uh, she's very analytical. She's, a, she's an accountant. She's really good with money. And when we were little, she loved to play Monopoly and she was super good at it. And I lost like every time we played and she, I would be in like all this debt because she was really good at Monopoly. And I played because, you know, I'm, I'm a good big brother and, and I wanted to make her happy. But if she had tried in the middle of a game to change the rules of Monopoly, I would have stopped playing, right? And that's what's happening here. The Republicans are trying to rig the rules of the game in their favor. And that's why we took the extraordinary step of walking out, breaking quorum and disrupting the entire legislative process. Um, if we allow the Republicans to do, do this here, then this entire American experiment will start to unravel. That's perfectly put. And uh, a warning to Madeline out there not to try anything. <laughs> I'm so glad I got to embarrass her on this <laughs> podcast. Uh, I will send her. I'm going to send her the link as soon as it's up. <laughs> um, so, look, I, I know that uh, a group of Texas Democrats have now met with Joe Manchin. So what can you tell me about that meeting? Because obviously, I mean, you know, that's what this all comes down to. Yeah, the meeting was surprisingly positive and productive. Um, the, the delegation we sent to meet with Manchin, you know, we selected our members very carefully. It was members who um, you know, shared similar politics uh, to Senator Manchin and could talk with them from that same perspective. And so the, they hit it off from, from what we hear. Uh, and, and Senator Manchin is very sympathetic to our cause. And, and he's a former Secretary of State in, in West Virginia. And so he believes in, in voting rights. And he wants to pass a voting rights bill. The, the issue is what's included and how expansive and, and, and how, how wide is the scope of this piece of legislation. But I think there was some movement on the fact that we can take steps to prevent something like what's about to pass in Texas from becoming state law. And, and honestly, you know, I, I, this is not an abstraction to us. You know, our constituents are having their rights 
undermined as we, as we speak. As you and I speak right now, my constituents are at risk of losing their God-given right at the ballot box. And so I, I need something to pass that's gonna protect them. That is my job as the state rep. Uh, I have to serve them. Um, and so if we can't get the full loaf this time, um, I'm gonna settle for whatever I can get to ensure that this bill in Texas does not become law. Well, look, we already know that Manchin supports um, some elements of the For the People Act. He's come out uh, with a list of, of provisions that he is supportive of. Um, but the issue, even if we do manage to get a pared down version of the For the People Act is obviously the filibuster. So was that included in talks? You know, whether or not, you know, Senator Manchin, um, you know, is able to bring along enough Republicans to avoid the filibuster or whether an exception needs to be made is really, uh, I don't mean to sound flippant, not my concern. You know, I'm not a, I'm not a senator. I'm not a federal lawmaker. I have one responsibility that's to represent my constituents in Williamson County, Texas. That's my job. And I have to make sure something passes to prevent their rights from being dismantled by Texas Republicans. And so I'm, and in many ways, I'm agnostic to the process. If Senator Manchin thinks he can find 10 Republicans to pass a voting rights bill, more power to him. Um, if we have to make an exception to the filibuster for voting rights, I think that's warranted. Just, just like what you and I talked about, voting rights is not like every other issue. Um, and so an exception, I think, um, is, is something that, that is worth considering. But either way, um, we have to get something passed and we have to get something passed now because we in Texas are out of time. Um, we needed action yesterday. Uh, and, and I hope that sense of urgency is what we're bringing to the conversation. You know, I, I get the feeling that a lot of folks nationally and a lot of folks in blue states, you know, are treating this uh, as an abstraction. Uh, they're treating this as a theoretical conversation, an intellectual exercise. But for folks like me in Texas, my colleagues in Georgia, this is not theoretical. This is not abstract. This is not intellectual. This is very real, very tangible, very visceral. Um, and so we need action. And the reason we came here, the reason we're doing this is to push the entire nation to act and to act now. One more question about this mansion situation and then we'll move on. But that is, uh, do you expect any type of announcement to basically discuss what the fruits of that meeting were? So from, from what I've gathered, and again, I, you know, I, I hate to try to get involved in Senate politics because it's not my expertise. And I'm, uh, this is my second time to be in Washington DC in my entire life. So I, I'm not an expert on what happens on Capitol Hill. But from what I gathered, folks wanted to get past the infrastructure conversation before really getting into the meat of this voting rights discussion, which means that our arrival here was timely. Um, the fact that we are here, uh, you know, as that, as the recess nears, uh, and the fact that uh, the infrastructure bill is starting to come to a close. And so I'm, I'm hoping that senators and leaders in, in the House of Representatives will now start in earnest developing what this framework will look like. Now, you had an interview with Fox host Pete Hegseth. Here is a brief clip from that interview. You have made a lot of money personally, and you've enriched a lot of corporations <laughs> with advertising by getting on here and spewing lies and conspiracy theories to folks who now trust you. About my and so what I'm asking you to do is I to see. tell your voters right now that Donald Trump hey, lost the election you've in 2020. At least you resolved that? the lie that is did you, Democrats did you are now for voter asked? ID. It's not did you your hear show, sir. But at least, did, I, at least you resolved the Trump, idea that Democrats are not for voter ID. Did Donald Trump lose the election in 2020? Real quick. Can you answer the question? Did Donald Trump lose the election in 2020? I'm questions. I'm not... Don't is, really this a, feel is, this, is this an uncomfortable, to an uncomfortable you. question for you? So clearly not super intent on answering the question whether Trump won the 2020 election. So I want to give you the floor and explain why it's so important that that was the question you asked. And I'll, I'll try really hard not to jump on top of every word you're saying. You know, I figure that'll be a nice, a nice change of pace from Pete Hegseth's physical incapability of not hearing his own voice for more than seven seconds at a time. <laughs> so, well, so I, I'm, I'm used to local... Uh, press uh, back in, home in Texas, right? And, and in many ways, local reporters, state reporters are so much better than, than the folks that you see on cable television, uh, especially Fox News primetime, um, because they're more interested in a dialogue than a monologue, right? They, they yeah. ask you a question, they listen to your answer, and then they ask a follow-up. That obviously is what I didn't get uh, on Fox News. I should have known better. Once I realized that that was the case, I decided to go ahead and ask some questions of my own. The reason I decided to ask about the big lie that the last election was stolen, the, the big lie that Donald Trump has, has spewed since, since he lost in 2020, is because it is the heart of this entire problem. The, the only reason, Brian, that you and I are talking right now, besides the fact that we're friends, the only reason you and I are talking is because of the big lie. Without that, we would not be here. I wouldn't be in Washington, D.C. I'd be back home in Texas. I'd be at my desk at the state capitol working on early childhood legislation or something that I care about. 
um, to make our state better. I wouldn't be here defending some basic rights to be able to participate in democracy. The entire reason that I'm here is because one man uh, could not accept factual reality. One man was willing to burn down our entire democratic system for his own ego. And until we grapple with that fact, we're not going to find our way out of this situation. And so I, I hope that that conversation on Fox News, which um, was not productive in, in many ways, I hope the silver lining is that it has refocused us uh, on the heart of the matter, which is this big lie that has gotten us into this mess in the first place. I've repeated, you know, countless times at this point that basically, you know, once you can get away from that, you'll take away their justification to pass all these restrictive voter suppression bills across the country because all of it's done under the pretense that the election was stolen. So once exactly right. once that lie is debunked, we can move on and start to, you know, all the other dominoes will fall. So, you know, I, I applaud you for, for using your time for good because clearly there wasn't going to be anything uh, anything any more productive than that uh, coming out of a conversation with Pete Hegseth. So did you get any feedback from the Fox audience after you went on? And and if so, was was any of it good? Um, so there was a lot of feedback. Hard to tell what how many audiences uh, were responding. Uh, the, you know, obviously that that exchange went went viral, and there were articles written about it. Then I was then it was very strange because then I was on other networks talking about my interview on Fox. It was yeah. you know kind of kind of like through the looking glass. But um, you know, I'm hoping what that what that did for the viewers of Fox is is show um, you know what this network is really all about. It's about profiting off of their anger. Um, Pete Hexeth is an educated man. You know, he he poked fun at the fact that I um, got a degree from Harvard, which I'm I'm very proud of. My, you know, I I had a I grew up with a single mom um, who didn't get to go to college, so going to Harvard was a big deal for our family. And he he poked fun at that, and until I realized after the show was over that he got a degree from Princeton, um, certainly <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, and so he's an educated man. He knows that Donald Trump's lie is not not based in in empirical evidence. Um, the reason he's doing this is for his own personal gain, right? And he's making a lot of money as a Fox News primetime host, and his corporate advertisers are making a lot of money. And so the people who are watching this network, including my own family members back in Texas, are being used um, for someone else's enrichment. Uh, and so I, I hope that at least we expose that for some viewers. Um, and if we did that, then I think my time was well spent on that network. So after you all went to D.C., uh, you know, to, to move from from uh, from one one shining example of the Republican Party to another. After you all went to D.C., Ted Cruz criticized you guys for getting on a private jet and leaving the state. Do you think Ted Cruz is trying to get ridiculed? Because I can't think of any other reason how he, of all people, could manage to say those words. Sometimes I can't tell if it's Ted Cruz or like an SNL cast member playing Ted <laughs> Cruz. Uh, he, he has become a caricature of himself. Um, the complete lack of self-awareness uh, yeah. for him to enter into this conversation is stunning. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I hope that that contrast uh, between, you know, my colleagues and I who left the state to, to serve our constituents uh, versus Senator Cruz who left the state to abandon his constituents is made very clear to the people of Texas, because that's the difference between our two parties. Um, one is interested in their own personal gain, their own personal ambition, their own personal enrichment. And one is interested in empowering the people of Texas um, to achieve their fullest God-given potential. And the contrast couldn't be starker. And I hope that we remember in the next election which party fought for Texans and which party fought for themselves. To build on what you just said and, and what people like Ted Cruz said when he called, you know, when he called this a political stunt, I can't imagine that you want to have left your homes and your families and your other jobs, you know, that you need to actually survive because as far as I know, your, 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 uh, your salary is what, $600 a month? Uh, that's, that's before taxes. So uh, <laughs> yeah, it's more like so, $400 a month. <laughs> so to, to leave all of this, to go to Washington, D.C., to beg Joe Manchin, of all people, to do something that he's been adamant about not doing. Who would want to have to lobby Joe Manchin to do the thing that he never said he'll do and eliminate the filibuster? One hell of a vacation. Sign me up. The amount of personal sacrifice that my colleagues have had to make to be here is, is really overwhelming. You know, I, we've had colleagues who have left their children. Um, some as you know, young as just a, a few months old. Um, we've had colleagues who have left um, elderly parents. We've had colleagues who have left 
sick and dying loved ones. Um, some of them had to leave their bedside to be here. Um, had rep had Representative uh, Celia Israel was postponed her wedding. Like, like right. I'm, I'm not married, but I have plenty of friends who are getting married, including right. my, my editor, Nick, who is uh, yeah. capturing this interview right now. Yeah, and right. I can just about promise you that the last thing on God's green earth that they would want right. to do is voluntarily postpone the thing that they've been planning and stressing over and paying for for months. That's exactly right. She canceled her wedding um, and you know, she celebrated her birthday yesterday here in a conference room uh, in the basement yeah. of a hotel. Um, and, uh, and so those, obviously those personal sacrifices are nothing compared to the, the sacrifices that brave Americans made long before you and I, right, at Normandy, at Selma, to protect the sacred right to vote. Um, the, the thing about this, though, is that Joe Manchin doesn't have to sacrifice anything. Uh, he really doesn't. All he has to do is make one exception to one Senate rule to save American democracy. It, it's, not, it's not that hard. Uh, it's a pretty light lift, and, and I'm a politician, so I understand you know what what it means to take a political risk, and, and this is not a this is not a substantial risk. So you have folks here that have come to the nation's capital, politicians just like Joe Manchin, who have to get elected, who have made personal and political sacrifices to do what's right for our country. All we're asking him is to do the very same. Well said. Uh, so now we're we're recording this on Friday, as of right now. We've already raised over one hundred and twenty-five thousand uh, dollars through an Act Blue that goes directly to the Texas House Democratic Campaign Committee. So, for the almost four thousand people that donated, uh, can you just kind of give an indication of what those funds are being used for? Well, first, I just want to tell you, you know, it's a very emotional thing to have people step up and have your back in a moment like this. Um, you know, this has been a tough. A week for us. Um, not only are we sleep deprived, I think I've gotten like a cumulative of 10 hours of sleep this week. Um, you know, not only are we run down, not only are we missing our families and our beloved home state of Texas, um, but we're also getting um, harassed and, uh, and attacked by the far right every single day. My office has been flooded, mostly from folks out of the state of Texas who have been brutal to my team and to me. Um, and that's that's hard on a on a person. You know, we're all, we're all elected officials. But we're also human beings, um, and this has been a very difficult week. But the the fact that total strangers um, have signed up with this project of yours to to give whatever money they have, hard earned money, I'm sure, to this this effort, it just um, it really does mean a lot, um, personally and and politically and professionally. So I just from the bottom of my heart just want to thank everyone who who donated, and also want to thank you, Brian, because you. You have a lot of different uh, competing priorities, a lot of projects you could support. And the fact that you lent your name, your credibility, your reputation uh, to this effort means a whole lot. And, um, and I, I, all of you, you and all of your supporters are, are honorary Texans in my book. Um, and I hope when all this is over, you guys come down to Texas and, and get some quality barbecue with us uh, <laughs> and celebrate because uh, you're a part of this fight now um, and, and you're in this with us. Uh, and so for, to answer your question, you know, that money is going to go to the HDCC, which is the entity we use um, as members to be able to, to fund different projects. This money will be used to protect our staffs um, because, as we mentioned earlier in this conversation, Governor Abbott canceled the entire legislative branch of government in Texas, which means that two, over 2,000 staff members are going to lose their salaries, their pay, and their health insurance on September 1 of this year um, because of the governor's veto. And these staff members, you know, I, I talk, I, I've been talking about how hard my colleagues have been working. These staff members have been working twice as hard. Um, they're the ones who have orchestrated the, the plane tickets. They're the ones who orchestrate the meals for us to eat, the, the bus ride at the Capitol. They're scheduling the meetings. They're, they're, creating, they're doing the research, right? They're doing the bill analysis. The, these staffers are, are the true superheroes of this effort. And, and we're going to repay them by taking away their pay and their health insurance that they and their families rely on. But because of your efforts, because of the efforts of your of your uh, audience, we're going to be able to to keep them afloat for a little while longer and, and buy us time to, to see how our lawsuit against the governor in the Texas Supreme Court works out. Um, and so you have you are you and your audience are single handedly um, keeping afloat an entire generation of staff members who are standing up for democracy as we speak. I'm glad to hear that. And obviously, 
Um, I should note that the fund is still open. So for anybody watching and listening, you can find the Act Blue in the post description of this podcast, this video, wherever you're wherever you're watching. So with that said, James, thank you so much not only for taking the time to speak with me today, but for what you and your colleagues are doing. You know, you've got an entire country behind you and, and we couldn't be more appreciative of, of your work to really get this to the forefront and, and put some pressure on national Democrats who frankly, uh, you know, haven't delivered thus far. And so we're, we're hoping that, uh, that what you guys are doing and putting, you know, your whole lives on hold to make this happen is gonna, is gonna have some impact. So thank you. We all, we all support and your friendship for keeping us going. Um, and we, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts.